watching The Jenny Lynn Show, and I'm Jenny Lynn Gleave, your host. And tonight, my guest is no stranger to television. I'm sure over the years, you have seen him on the 10 o'clock news reporting for Fox, Mr. Lloyd LaQuesta. But before I introduce Mr. LaQuesta, if you see red spots on me, I am not trying to be like Meghan Markle and tattoo freckles on myself. It's just a violent reaction to something I ingested. Lloyd, thank you so much for coming on the show. I just had to say that because I heard all the young girls are tattooing freckles because Megan has got freckles. So I want to make sure they know that's not what I did. Yeah, I, I thought you were just having an allergic reaction to me being on your show. <laughs> I, hope, I hope not. Fortunately, this started before you showed up. Good. So I'm pretty sure that's not what's happening. No, you look fine. Thank you. So it's been a while, Lloyd. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. Tell us what you've been up to. Uh, I look like Rip Van Winkle now, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're still the very handsome guy you always yeah. were. But, so, but you know, it's um, I used to be Lloyd LaQuesta. <laughs> I'm not on television anymore, so uh, you know. You will never stop being Lloyd LaQuesta, uh, well. even if you change your name. That face only belongs to that person. Okay. Anyway, thank you for inviting me here. And um, I guess, we, you know, we're here to discuss something that I did uh, last month. Um, yes. And it's part of, uh, one, one of the things that uh, I, I do in retirement now is that I serve on various boards of nonprofits. And uh, one of the boards that I spend a lot of time on is, is called Donor Network West. Okay. Which is a... Uh, nonprofit agency that basically regulates the transplantation of human organs and tissues okay. in California and Nevada. Very important issue has to do with, you know, getting people also to register to become organ and tissue donors. Okay. Um, and basically try and save lives. Right. So tell us, the story you're here to discuss tonight has to do with the first organ donor. Well, so it has to do with a story that I did in 1980, 38, 38 years ago. And uh, there was a um, young lady by the name of Betsy Sneath. Betsy was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, and she was at Stanford University in 1980. She was 18 years old, and she was waiting for a heart. Stanford at the time was doing, becoming world renowned for heart transplants. They, right. Dr. Norman Shumway, was a team that did the first heart transplant here in the United States. So Stanford then became a, a center for, for heart transplants. Okay. So Betsy was there, and Betsy, in her own words, said that she was dying. She had been given two years to live unless she received a new heart. And if you can imagine, you're 18 years old, you had your whole life in front of you, and now you're faced with having to wait for someone to die and perhaps donate their organs so that you could have life. Gosh. Very, um, and, and I had become involved and interested in the heart transplants uh, that, that Stanford was doing. So I met, I met Beth, Betsy. Um, Betsy always carried a pager. Back then they had pagers. She was waiting for that pager to go off to oh let her gosh. know that there was an organ that's available. Uh, Betsy waited... Uh, I, I can't remember how many months it was, but uh, she eventually got a heart, and a, a successful heart transplant. So she went on with her life. Four years later, Betsy became pregnant. Uh, she had a relationship with someone, and she never disclosed who the father was, but she wanted to have a baby. Doctors told her that you need to abort the child because we have no idea how your new heart will react to childbirth. Oh my gosh. She, uh, she refused to do that because she wanted the baby so badly. She wanted to have, she wanted to experience motherhood. She wanted to know what it's like to have a child. Oh my gosh. Betsy um, went on to have a baby girl uh, named Sierra Jameson Sneath. Jameson was for Dr. Stuart Jameson, who was the doctor, the surgeon at Stanford who transplanted her new Aww. heart. Well, B Betsy uh, 
well, she became the first person in the world, the first heart transplant recipient in the world to have a child. Unfortunately, Betsy died five months later. Her heart, oh, no. her new heart failed. And um, was that because of the pregnancy? Were they ever able to determine? It, it was. It was because of the pregnancy because apparently, and we found out this later that Betsy, when you when you receive a new organ, you have to take certain drugs to prevent rejection. Well, Betsy was so determined to be a mother that she stopped taking some of those anti-rejection -re drugs. Is that because she was afraid it would interfere with the fetus? She was afraid that it could harm the fetus. So, um, you know, the, the thing about Betsy, Betsy was in a way a pioneer because now heart transplant recipients, women, do have children because they learn something from Betsy's Her experience. Own, you know, experience. Yeah. But so Betsy went on and, and she had she uh, had this baby, and then she died. So now you shift back to um, March of this year, and like many people, I carry a phone, and I get text. Suddenly, w one day in March, I get a text that said, are you the same Lloyd LaQuesta who did a story about Betsy Sneath back in 1980? Wow. And, and I, looked at, I looked at that, and yeah, it started bringing back a flood of memories about Betsy and about the whole experience. So that text was from a woman named Sierra Jameson Sneath Grandy. The daughter. The child that was born 33 years earlier is now a full grown woman. Oh my goodness. And she is on a, a search to find out more about her mother and um, she also wants to find out more about the family who, of the person whose heart was transplanted in her mother. Because that act of donating a heart saved Betsy's life for to her. To give birth to her. To give birth to her. So it's two lives actually created. What but, a story. Yeah. So, um, and I, so then I asked, I, I started communicating with her, and I asked her, well, how did you find out about me? And she said, well, my, her mother, she calls it her mother, is actually Betsy Sneet's mother, who adopted her, the grandchild and raised, raised her. So Aww. she said, so my mother gave me a box, and in that box was a letter that you had written to my par her parents, or to Betsy's parents, after the death of Betsy Sneet and also some videotapes that I sent, because I wanted, I wanted that child, who's now a grown woman, to know something about her mother. And you so are so the, awesome. So the videotapes allowed her to see her mother, to know about her, to hear her speak, and that's what led to her tracking me down. And um, so what happened with wow. that whole story is that I was very moved by that story of also. Of course, well, I am. Um, so I, I said to, uh, I'm on the board of directors of Donor Network West, which is a, what we call an OPO, an organ procurement organization. Okay. They also said the story just moved them also. So we decided to do a video project, which took a while mainly because uh, I had left for the month of April. I was, I was in Europe for the whole month. So we had to wait until I came back to finish the, the project. Is there a link that we could link to this? If you yes, if you go to donornetworkwest.com, and there's a series of um, you know, menus on there, but one of them says media or news releases. Click on that, and you'll see a story that's called um, My Mother's Heart. And it's that story. So what we did is that uh, Donor Network West actually contacted uh, Sierra in the Pittsburgh area and arranged for her to fly out here to the wow. Bay Area to actually meet me for the first time. Why didn't she come with you <laughs> <laughs> on the Jenny Lynn show? It would have been great if well, I could have had her well, here with we're, you. We're, we're doing this video. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, uh, which kidding. was filmed and everything. And, um, and during that time, I only communicated with Sierra on social media. 
I did email or text. I never picked up the phone and called her because mm -hmm. I we wanted uh, to talk in person rather than on the phone. And everything. Yes. So um, it was a, ver a very emotional meeting. Uh, I, I hope if you have a chance and the audience has a chance to see the video. So we met and shared. I shared with her about her mother. And then we also went down to Stanford at the exact same location where I interviewed her mother before she had her transplant. What a story. And we sort of redid the daughter, mother type of story. But one of the things that I told Sierra was that um, as a journalist, um, you're a spectator, not a participant. And when I did the story about Betsy Sneath, her mother, I really held back because I wanted to give her a hug because at that time she was waiting to see that. whether she'd get a, a heart. heart and whether she'd live or die. And I wanted to give Betsy a hug to tell her, you know, it's okay, you're going to be okay. But I never did because I sort of followed that rule of being a journalist, of not being involved with the person you're doing a story about. Sometimes it's almost impossible because well, you're human. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that, that in that video you'll see also is that I'd never hugged Betsy, but I got to hug Sarah, her, daughter. her daughter. Does her daughter look like her? In some ways, they're both, they're both tall. Um, and uh, Sierra shares her mother's eyes. Her, mo her mother had very big sort of eyes that uh, was always um, always a glow, I'd say, you know. Betsy Sneath was a, 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 a very interesting woman. She, um, of course, she went to that, that time when she thought that she was going to die. So she just threw everything in the winds, I'll do whatever I want. Of course, she was, you know, she was 17 at that time. Yeah, but and, I think that's the attitude most people would have yeah. if you think you're going to die, yeah. right? And then, then she sort of said, I became religious, and I felt that, you know, God must have a purpose for this and everything. So th then after she received, received her heart, um, she, she went back to uh, Pens uh, Pennsylvania and actually ran for the city council in her hometown and won. Wow, she was a very driven woman. Very driven woman. Clearly. But then, uh, then she had this relationship, and I don't know what, what the reason was, but she left and came to California. So when she had the baby, she was actually living in San Diego. Um, uh -huh. um, and, um, Do you know how old she was? Or how many years did she get to enjoy the heart before well, she lost so her she life? Well, so she had the heart in, in 1980, and then she had the baby in 1984. So she got four years of the heart. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. impressive for being back then, right? Well, I, you know, if she hadn't had the baby, the baby she probably would have lived longer. Because you know? there's no question that it, that it put... First of all, she received the heart of a 23-year-old man who died in a traffic accident. So medically, no one knows how a male heart would work, in a, woman. work in a birth. In they say men don't situation. have hearts. That's not true. <laughs> men do have hearts. Yeah. <laughs> I have to throw that in there. But, but so, you know, essentially what this video is about is, again, to talk about organ and tissue donations. Yes. And that uh, it's really important that all of us, first of all, think about it and uh, talk about it with your, with your family and friends, whether or not you want to list yourself as an organ donor. And um, I'll give you some, some numbers. Yeah, why, why don't so, you say why them? Why it's so important, not, not telephone numbers, but why it's so important that people consider becoming put on the registry f as an organ donor. Um, every day, an average of 20 people die while on a waiting list for waiting an for an organ or tissue donation. Every 10 minutes, another person is added to an organ or tissue waiting list. It's a growing, growing list. And um, frankly, uh, there's not enough organs or tissue to go around to help people save their lives. So it, it's, it's a very personal decision when a person decides to become an organ donor. But 
on the average, uh, if someone donates an organ, dies, and and is on an um, a waiting is on a registry that he consented, he or she consented to donate their organs or tissues. Yeah. It can be saved. It can be used by eight patients. It could save eight lives from wow. one person. One person. So we want to encourage people now to document somewhere that if they die suddenly that their organs can be used. Well, the, and the most simple thing is that, uh, I don't know whether you carry it or some of other people here, but on your driver's license, you have an opportunity to register as an organ donor. I think so I did. dot that goes I, in your, and it's, it's a very simple procedure. You just check, yes, I will be an organ donor. So I must ask you this, and I don't want to interrupt you, but I don't want to forget to ask you, were you able to track down the guy whose heart was donated to Betsy. No, that's that's a little more <clears> difficult <throat> because um, you know a lot His of the family. families prefer to remain anonymous in this. Oh. Um, uh, at this point, uh, because we we did this uh, video and everything, there's no family that's come forward. Okay. So we're not pursuing this unless we get some call from some family. I only asked you that because the daughter wanted to meet that donor family, right, right. so that's why and I asked. It, and, and it has to be the donor family that agrees to something like that. So the daughter who came out here that did the story with you, <clears throat> visually, how did she appear to you, having had this opportunity to come out and go to Stanford and meet well, you and find out about her mother? So how has this changed her life? So there's, there's, a, there's a postscript sort of to this story also, in that one of the reasons why um, Sierra wanted to get information, she's a mother herself. Oh, she's a she mother. She has two sons. So her mother, um, basically the condition she had was that she had a cancer in her heart. Oh, okay. So now... And then when, when uh, Betsy died, they did a uh, autopsy. They found she had a tumor growing in her brain also. Now, Betsy's father died of cancer. And Sierra shared with me that she's undergoing chemotherapy right now also because a cancer was discovered in her. Jeez. So she needs to find out more because she's concerned about her sons. That is there a gene that's being carried in their family? Exactly. That that she wants to see whether her, if her sons are carrying, uh, can something be done now to, to save them, to help them? Uh, um, so I thought those types of genes used to skip a generation, but I guess not this one. It's a whole new field, not not you know very much is known about this. Isn't that amazing? It's just going down from one generation to the next. Yeah. So, in a way, you know, uh, Sierra is carrying on what her mother's motivated. She wants to save her children, too, to, from further harm, if, if that's possible. So her chemotherapy that she's currently undergoing, do you know what the prognosis is? Has she mentioned well, that? Well, I've, 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 I've sort of communicated with her, and she's, you know, she's progressing okay, and you know, she's still functioning. So, uh, and she's just waiting to see, you know, what happens. We are so blessed, those of us that haven't got to worry with these things. I mean, what, what should we complain about? My back hurts and I think <laughs> I'm dying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we are, we are lucky because I couldn't imagine how I would feel if I had to carry a monitor every day, waking up, hoping somebody's gonna give me the organ that keeps me. Right. Alive. Right. right. What have you learned from this experience, Lloyd? What well, is your takeaway from this? You know, this? I have to tell you, there's also what, uh, another story that, you know, is sort of the power of the media. Um, years after B uh, Betsy's story, um, I was doing another sort of transplant story at Stanford. It was around Christmas time, and there was a family from Castro Valley whose patriarch, the father, needed a new heart. So I did interviews with them and everything, and then at the end of, I was doing what we call a live shot. I was standing in front of a camera doing live, and so this thought came into my mind to do something. So I said something to the effect that, uh, you know, this is a time when we give cards. It's the Christmas season, 
And I reached into my pocket and I pulled out my driver's license with the pink, pink dot. dot. And I said, you know, you might want to think about signing one of these cards because it's the ultimate gift, the gift of life. You would, if it's used, you would never meet the person who receives it. Right. But you will have saved a life. So two weeks later, so it's the new year, it's the start of another new year, and the phone rings in my office, and this woman says, hi, I wanted to call you and ask about a story that you did. I said, you know, ma'am, I do a lot of stories. And she said, no, it was a story just a few weeks ago. It was about a family holding a vigil for a man who needed a heart. I said, yes. She, and she said, I was watching that night, and a few hours later, my daughter was involved in a traffic accident and declared brain dead. And even in oh my, my deepest God. grief, I remembered what you said, and I picked up the phone and I called Stanford, and I donated my daughter's heart and lungs. I'm getting chills. <laughs> so like most journalists, wow. I, I, my only immediate reaction was, um, can I come over and interview you? And she said, no. I don't even want you to know my name. I just want you to know that sometimes you journalists say things or write things and you don't think that anyone listens. I listened that night and I reacted to what you said. So I use that as an example of the power of the media and that when I was teaching journalism to college students that you have to be very, very careful what you write, what you say. Or what you do. The media, camera. because it can affect someone's life. Oh. If it affects only one person, then you've, you've affected someone. So why don't we pause the interview here for me to ask you, if someone does, is it too late for people to go and add that they want to donate no, organs? It's never too late. So how um, do they, what do they you, do? You can either, as I said, you know, you can do it through the DMV. Okay. Or you can just, Go to, you could go to the Donor Network West site and you could register to Donor Network West. Or you could just uh, Google organ donations and you'll see sites come up saying how you can register as an organ donor. It's a very simple process. You know, so much of this is people want to, but they're not aware that some people are not aware of the need and some people don't know how. Right. So I'm so happy we're doing this story. Not that that many people watch my show, but hopefully if three people see this and know of someone or can mention it to people, I think it's just like the story I heard of where all the fish washed up on the sea and the boy was there with his dad trying to throw them back in. And the father told him, what are you doing? You can never throw them back in. And then pretty soon everyone else on the beach saw what right. the little boy was doing. Everybody got up, started so throwing the fish back, back in, yeah. and they saved a lot of fish. So let's all start finding out how we can donate organs um, because at the end of the day, when we're dead, what good are they to us? It, you know, but it's not a, a simple decision for, for a lot of people because there's a lot of issues. With religion, religious, yeah. you know, moral issues. And I, you know, not everyone. It's not what everyone wants to do, and which is fine. But if, if there are those who want to do it, then uh, I can't think of a better way to continue life right. on this planet. Well, I know this song's morbid, but they can have mine because I was going to burn the rest anyway. <laughs> 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 so we are down to like five minutes. I want to make sure we cover everything that's critical to this story. And if have I not asked you anything that you want to make sure you share? No, no. I, you know, I, I think that. Um, well, one of the things is that I, I always tell people that don't do it just by yourself. Discuss this issue with your family or friends, because uh, you know, organ donation, organ transplants, um, does have a lot of sort of. Um, legal framework about it, you know. So you could say right now, okay, I'm gonna be an organ donor, but then you die and you never sort of convey that to your family, and so they don't know that. And if they don't know that, they could actually stop that from saying, no, we don't want that to happen. So is this something people need to leave in their wills? 
Uh, well, you, you want to let it, people know that you've signed paperwork saying that you're an organ donor. Oh, okay. So, uh, to make sure that people are aware, your family, your friends, that this are your wishes to do something like that. Okay, so we're just about at a wrap, but before we do that, could you mention the website again, and can you also mention the link once more where so you it, can access donor the story? it's DonorNetworkWest, okay. which is uh, DonorNetworkWest.org. And uh, just go to that uh, website. And, and the tab for the story, what is the tab they so click the, on? So that there are tabs, and then you, you want to go to uh, either media or news releases or videos. There's three okay. tabs there. And they'll be able to read the entire story right. about Betsy and her right. mother. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for watching The Jenny Lynn Show. I feel very privileged that I get to share the set with people like Lloyd, who have created such a difference in people's lives. And it's my hope when I do these shows that I'm making a difference in someone's life. So Lloyd, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you to my crew. I don't always remember to thank them. I could never do this show without them. I love each of them. And because of them, I can bring these stories to you. And please go to the website that Lloyd has mentioned and look at the story and find out how you or people you know might be able to save lives. And as always, thank you for watching The Jenny Lynn Show, and I will see you next time. Thank, thank you, Lloyd.